Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to call this March 11th meeting and public hearing of the Blackstone Millville Regional School District to order. Uh, if you would please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Come on, y'all. Just stand up. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, we will do introduction of members. I am Jane Reggio from the town of Millville. Erin Vinaco, Millville. Tammy Lemieux, Blackstone. Carrie Tar Goddard, Blackstone. <laughs> Tara Larkin, Millville. Sarah Williams, Blackstone. Jack Heath, Blackstone. Matt Aaronworth, Assistant Superintendent. Jason DeFalco, Superintendent. And Jill's way back there yep. hiding. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I would like to um, entertain a motion to open our uh, public hearing for our budget. So moved. Moved by Aaron. Second. Second by Tammy. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. And we'll turn it over to Dr. Or I don't know. Who's doing Matt? Dr. Uh, Matt and I are going to do it together, okay, actually. together. Yes. All right. You're on. All right. Thanks, Ms. Reggio. Good evening, everybody. It's really nice to see everybody in person and not uh, behind the screen. So thrilled to be here tonight uh, and uh, very much looking forward to um, discussing a few important items. First of which, of course, is uh, a public uh, presentation and conversation on our proposed FY22 uh, budget. Um, and just like uh, all of our prior budgets, the budget for next school year is very much anchored in our district improvement strategy. Um, and ensuring that as we move through uh, the year, we have the uh, resources and the right staff to help us fulfill our purpose and our uh, promise to our children in both Blackstone and Millville, uh, which is to create happy, healthy, and proficient students that are ready for college, career, and community. Uh, and I will just say before we launch into this um, that uh, I know we talk about our district improvement strategy uh, often, um, it even has a nice little nickname of the fidget spinner. Um, and uh, I know we discuss our purpose often, but I will tell you, uh, having been through the last year, uh, it was a meeting uh, tonight, one year ago, when we had to uh, make some difficult the decisions thing. around professional emergency PD days and looking at what the future was going to mean as we entered into, our, uh, uh, into the pandemic. Um, our strategy and our purpose very much were the guiding lights through this in terms of helping us stay focused on making sure that we were doing our best to do the work for the children in front of us. And whether that was physically in person or uh, across a uh, screen. But uh, so we're very grateful uh, to, to be able this evening to talk a little bit about what our budget looks like for next year, specifically in relation to our district improvement strategy. And uh, I would argue more importantly, how we are going to bring our students uh, back safely and start to work on closing some of the uh, teaching and learning gaps that have been created by the pandemic. Um, so we want to first start by just highlighting who are our students. Um, and uh, currently our enrollment is around 1,600 students. We're expecting that to uh, increase and go back to uh, right around 1,800 where it normally is. Uh, but you can see a quick overview of our demographics um, and this is in, uh, essentially uh, what our student body is made up uh, of as it relates to our uh, ethnicity, race, our ELL, uh, English language learner population, students with special needs, our high needs and free and reduced lunch population. Uh, just really important to remind uh, those folks that might be tuning in at home, high needs is a combination of a student that is either an English language learner and qualifies for free and reduced lunch or is a special education student and qualifies for free and reduced lunch or uh, a child that might uh, actually be all three. Um, and so it's just important to note what that is. Uh, that means that um, about 38% of our students either qualify for uh, free and reduced lunch and or have a special need uh, or a, a uh, English language learner. <clears throat> so just a quick highlight on that. And of course, we look at, uh, we are about 38% uh, free and reduced lunch. And again, I wanted to share with, with the committee and the community at home, 
In 2010, we were around uh, 10%. So it is important to note uh, over time how our demographic continues to change, and that is perfectly fine with us. Uh, we welcome every single child and will continue to welcome every single child and family that walks through our doors and ensure that we are doing our best to provide uh, for all of their needs. So before we get into the actual uh, nuts and bolts of uh, the, the numbers end of the budget, we want to just talk for a moment about uh, some of the work that we have done to work outside of the budget and secure additional funding uh, through grants for unique programs for our students. Uh, while I'm not going to sit and kind of talk through each one um, of these grant opportunities, I do want to highlight that how we have looked at uh, which grants as a school system we will be um, you know, working towards. Uh, we first start with looking at the needs of our students and we look at um, each of the individual school improvement plans and our district improvement strategy. And so what you'll see in front of you uh, this evening is a complement of grants that we have gone after, uh, the top half particularly really outlining the work that we are trying to do around career development for our students. Um, you, I'm sure you're aware that annually we send over 80% of our students to a two or four year college. And our kids do very well. Our students do very, very well um, when they get to their two or four year institution. However, what we continue to improve upon is the career development piece of our purpose and making sure that our students are not only college ready, but they're career ready. And so we're doing that through uh, various programs that start down, frankly, as uh, in sixth grade. And um, we are very excited, uh, just to highlight here, as one uh, particular uh, new opportunity that has come up uh, for our middle school, um, we are applying for um, a few new units of, of instruction, uh, a few new units of learning for our students, one in grade six, one in seven, and one in eight, uh, particularly around green energy, biomedicine. Uh, we really want to start exposing our students to the future um, that they have in front of them in terms of career pathways. Uh, that will also feed very well into uh, BMR High School. Uh, as you know, we have implemented this year, uh, despite the pandemic, a new uh, biomedical pathway. And next year we are implementing, uh, we were awarded a $40,000 grant to start the engineering and manufacturing pathway, which we're very excited about. Mm -hmm. And of course, through our collaboration uh, with uh, surrounding school districts within the Blackstone Valley and our superintendent consortium group, um, we are also offering cybersecurity and a welding course uh, this year. So uh, for those of you that are listening at home and thinking, you know, we've got to make a diff you know, difficult decision, I would argue that decision is not that difficult. Uh, BMR High School is certainly the direction to move in, uh, as are all of our schools. Uh, we've made significant investments in uh, all four of our buildings over the past uh, few years to really improve uh, the core programming and opportunities through various pathways for our children. So just a little bit about some of the uh, work being done in that area. So we talk a bit about the why behind this year's budget. Uh, one of the main pieces as we think about how do we intentionally, strategically bring students safely back into our classrooms, which of course is the first kind of rung of that work, we also need to be thinking about how do we make sure that we are meeting both the academic and the social, emotional, behavioral needs of our children. Um, I will tell you very anecdotally, of course, um, it's not uh, kind of hard data, so to speak, but uh, having spent uh, the past couple weeks visiting classrooms uh, across all, all four schools uh, and in our community and our committee is probably aware that throughout this, we've been trying to bring more students back, even small groups um, across uh, all of our grade levels. It's very obvious um, who the students are that have just returned newly to the classroom. Mm. Um, it, it is going to take some time to help our students settle back in and learn how to, and I'll kind of put in quotes, but do school. Um, and so, uh, you know, as we, as we look forward through our budget this evening, I do think it's important to really underscore the why behind these numbers. Uh, because it's not just about taking the district to the next level with its improvement strategy, uh, but it's also about how do we return and recover in a way that is going to help, A, assess the needs of our children and families, and B, meet those needs. And so when we look at uh, the, the 
academic data slide uh, before us this evening, and as we've talked about before as a committee, of course, um, you can see we have some significant needs that need to be met academically. Um, and so uh, we are very much dedicated to that, that work we're not waiting to start. Uh, we have started that, uh, frankly, now, uh, before now. Um, but wanted to just share that academically, we've got a lot of work to do to close the gap that was created as a result of, uh, of the pandemic. So our budget process to date, um, I know that many people who are watching have been following the process, but we'll just outline it briefly. As Dr. DeFalco mentioned, we started this process by sitting down with our leadership team and clearly emphasizing to our principals that we need to identify ways to remediate both the academic and the social emotional gaps that these students are gonna be coming back to us with, while still fostering the work around each individual school's instructional focus. So from there, the principals worked with their um, department leaders, they spoke with their staff, they've got needs assessments from their buildings and the cost center managers, those being um, special education, music, athletics, et cetera. And those individuals in conjunction with the principals put together their budgets. They put these budgets together to both support their school improvement plans and to tie directly into the continued work of our district blueprint for improvement. The next step was presenting those budgets to the public. And as everyone hopefully was able to see through the recorded sessions, we had our budget workshops earlier. And um, knowing the difficulties faced by both towns, the next step after the budget workshops, the school administration and the school committee met back again to review the needs based budget and really comb through and identify areas that we could potentially try to either reorganize, uh, shave off a little bit of the funding. And we were able to reduce that needs-based budget by approximately $350,000 in working with the school committee. That being said, there is a lot left in this budget that is integral to the work that we need to continue doing moving into FY22. And we did want to highlight that. Um, for starters, teachers put in requests. We had curriculum materials. We had those remediation resources. Those key pieces of the work are still in this budget. Uh, we moved some funds around. We looked at ways to make sure we were serving the needs of all of the students that we're going to have in front of us. So you can see some of the materials and resources we are going to support the um, we are going to support the ELA program implementation. I believe we actually have already purchased the math curriculum materials just to get ahead of that. Um, we have we have plans for the enhancement of our career readiness programs. Our social emotional learning resources are still extremely important for us as we have these students coming back with these gaps. We are going to continue as a district, our focus on understanding and appreciating diversity and our social equity programs. So we have resources that are built into the budget for those things. And very much, I hope to the town's appreciation, we have heard the requests and we wanted to respond in kind with making sure that we were funding our other post-employment benefits, otherwise known as OPEB. This is a fund that will be starting to try to maintain the um, employment benefits for our retirees in the future. So this is really a long-term investment that we will see hopefully grow and be able to continue to fund um, those those needs as we move forward because we do not want to forget about our retirees you. which we will hopefully be one of one day hopefully not 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 anytime soon eh, well give me a week no. in addition to the resources and materials um, we are able to uh, bring on some very important positions uh, for next year 
some of which are uh, we are considering uh, more temporary positions, which we'll talk about and we'll, we'll explain the why behind those. And some that we will be building into the budget every year uh, moving forward that will be uh, really critical to helping to continue to advance our school district forward with, its, uh, with our improvement strategy. Uh, but the first is uh, the addition of a planning, teaching, and learning coach. Uh, and that position will be at Millville Elementary, as uh, everyone is aware. We've reorganized our elementary schools through our approved regional agreement. Um, next year, Millville Elementary will be uh, preschool, kindergarten, and first grade. And the JFK AFM complex uh, will be grades 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then school year 22, 23, so the following year, um, Millville Elementary will be preschool, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade and the JFK AFM complex will be grades three, four, and five. <clears throat> so it's gonna take two years to finalize that build out, um, but we know that the needs uh, of our teachers and of our students are different um, at, across the elementary range. So we are going to be placing a uh, early childhood instructional coach um, at um, Millville Elementary and moving uh, our current elementary coach, which is a K-6 position to um, the uh, complex. I think it's important to note here, though, that that is not uh, new money that was added to the budget. Uh, if uh, folks are aware, the JFK AFM complex uh, used to have an assistant principal position. We reorganized that position into an additional planning, teaching, and learning coach to push those supports directly to the classroom for teachers and kids um, at both schools. So we restructured that uh, those those dollars and are utilizing them this way. Um, the uh, next position is a math interventionist at our high school. Um, again, when we talk about our uh, academic progress, this year has caused some significant challenges for uh, all of our students. Uh, the high school certainly was not exempt from that. Um, in addition to that, the school committee might be aware uh, or recall Two years ago, uh, when we got our received our MCAS results from the Department of Education, under the old uh, MCAS requirements, we were at 99 percent uh, proficient, proficient, which was unbelievable. And then under the new provisions, we were at 56 percent when they changed the goalpost on us uh, through the midway through the game, so to speak. Um, so we know that we've got to double down our efforts and make sure that we're providing as much support to our students as possible, uh, not for MCAS purposes, certainly, but to make sure that they're able to keep up with the academic rigor um, that is going to be and is in front of them. Um, next, we are looking for a similar position um, to be shared across the elementary schools. So we are looking for a elementary math interventionist. Um, again, we are seeing right now, uh, as we uh, remember from the middle of year data conversation we had a couple of meetings ago, our fourth and fifth graders are struggling significantly in mathematics. Um, it's been a big challenge. So we know we're going to need to do some very targeted work there with intervention. Uh, we are going to be increasing our reading specialist um, at the middle school. It will be a shared position, but uh, we're currently working out the structure for that. Um, at our two elementary schools, um, and I'm sure the community will recall when we had meetings around the regional agreement and the need to reorganize the two elementary schools, we talked a lot about equity and access to programs for kids. And so one of the things that uh, we committed to, and, and uh, you're seeing it here this evening, is the addition of two new STEM teachers at the elementary level. We're really excited about this. This is an opportunity for students to get really hands-on with science, technology, engineering, and math, starting all the way down to our preschoolers. Um, so we're really excited about that, and we're so pleased that um, you know the commitment we made to parents around the equity uh, piece and access for all students, we were able to go forward with those two positions. We were also looking to expand our preschool uh, programming. We are looking to uh, put together a uh, opportunity to give families five days a week of preschool to increase our preschool numbers, not just the days, but to get more families in. Uh, we know our students just do better in kindergarten when they come prepared uh, with their early learning uh, literacy and uh, math skills. So we are looking forward to expanding our preschool options for families next year. Um, we are also going to be adding a substantially separate teacher, which is for students with significant special needs for, pre, uh, for grades K and 1. We'll be hiring a one-on-one -on -one nurse. 
um, and an ABA um, technician for our preschool classroom. And that's somebody to work directly with those student behaviors to help ensure that our students, are, our youngest students, our youngest learners are able to stay on task uh, with the work in front of them and a part-time custodian. So that brings us to the numbers in front of you where we have the FY22 budget for certification. Um, I won't go down the list of each function code, um, but what you can see is the bottom line of the district developed budget is uh, $25,975,000. So this number represents the actual budget that was developed at the district level. So there are also other expenses that we have to incorporate into our budget. Um, those include there's $656,000 that we have to expend in school choice spending costs. And there are another 669 plus thousand dollars that we spend in charter school uh, tuition costs, which brings us um, to the total number. Oh, one digit got cut off a little on this page. I apologize. Oh, that's weird. It's good on ours. <laughs> it's uh, the total district budget is twenty-seven million three hundred thousand six hundred and ninety three dollars as i said this includes the cost of sending students to charter schools to the school choice placements and also a significant number of out of district placements as well but that breakdown can be seen in the in the graph on the previous page this also um, in your package this evening there's going to be an, alter an alternate presentation of the budget. Um, it has all of the grant expenditures and fees removed. I want to be clear for the committee, it is the same exact budget. It comes to the same total number. It's simply presented in a different format because that's the way the DOR would like to see it, the Department of Revenue. They use those specific numbers to certify our E&D at the end of the year. So we just need to put it in a format where we've taken out all of the grant expenditures and other fees that we would have applied, like uh, user fees and some other classroom rental fees, et cetera. Matt, can I just add one piece? So Please. the total, the $27.3 I just want to make sure that folks at home understand um, that this includes all of our current programming activities. Nothing has been reduced from that. Uh, it also includes what we need to do to get to the next level with our district improvement um, strategy. So things like our additional instructional coach, the STEM teachers, um, additional staff development uh, needs that we have, our um, additional supports for literacy, our exploration of a new math series, a new math program, uh, which we'll be continuing with during next uh, school year. Uh, and of course, all of our social, emotional, and behavioral supports for students and it includes the work for return and recovery to help us uh, mitigate the gaps that have been created through the pandemic. So I just want to make sure that that, you know, when we look at this, we understand that it is actually really meeting the objectives of three main significant areas, running the district, advancing the district and closing the gaps as a result of the pandemic. And to that point, Jason, I would also add with all of that incorporated into this number, this entire uh, school budget is still 2.73% higher than our last budget. So we have put these things in, we're addressing all of these needs, and we're still trying to be very conscious of the needs of the towns and make sure that we brought this to a place where it's palatable for the communities. So on this page, you can see our assessment summaries. So the question comes up always, what does this mean for our towns? So if you look to the right on this page, these are the assessment summaries that are fully established at this point. Um, I won't go through each of the lines, but you can see that the total assessment on to Blackstone comes to $10,226,689. Uh, that equates to a 3.87% increase over last year total, which includes the capital. 
So that needs to be noted because uh, Blackstone's capital expenses also went up. Without their capital, uh, this represents a 3.7% increase to the just operating budget of the district. Millville's total comes to $3,368,019, which uh, with capital comes to a 1% increase. And minus the capital, their capital, uh, Millville's capital actually decreased this year because we have yet to see any principal payments come in for the boiler project that we just completed. So the capital costs are slightly lower this year. But with the capital removed, it's a 1.35% increase to Millville's budget over last year. And Matt, can I just add to that? Please. So collectively from the towns, it's, it's roughly $14 million of the $27 million budget. So I think that's an important uh, piece to highlight because $13 million, that, right, so the rest that gets us to the $27 million is from state funding and grants. Mm -hmm. So just those at home, you know, just so folks understand, uh, we get about half of the budget locally from the towns and about half from the state and from grants. So these are the numbers and the assessments that we are presenting this evening to the committee and to the public. And we are hoping to have these approved and certified this evening. Okay. Well, thank you both, thank you. Mr. Aaronworth, Dr. DeFalco. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I will open up the discussion to anyone in the public who might have questions or concerns as it relates to the budget. We will have another public forum in our meeting if you're here for other topics, but if you have budget questions or concerns or need more information, now is your opportunity. Mr. Watson, you might want to come right up to this microphone right here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good. We're making you move. Uh, I, whenever this comes out, we all, we get uh, every year, and I always try to get to find out how it is the expenses are running on a per pupil basis, okay? And we've got the numbers here uh, for Blackstone and Millville. How was it last year uh, for the numbers? Matt, do you want to answer that? So, um so I, I don't have on this presentation the per pupil expenditures listed. When we release the budget book, which we follow shortly after with the detailed budget provided that this um, is certified, that information is, is put out there. Um, that will also include the in-district expenditures per pupil and the out of the expenses for out of district. Um, at, at it, on this sheet right here, I, I do not have that information, but I can certainly send that forward to you, Mr. Watson. And well, it will you, be part of our overall uh, budget book presentation when we bring this information to the towns. To, to the towns. Absolutely. You know, kind of, yep. You got the, that question up front. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that does it. But it's uh, one of the things I think is... Uh, for the public, for everybody to try to understand what is going on, uh, you know the the one percent increase in uh, budget. This sounds very very good, uh, and but if you have a, a good drop in the number of uh, students, it's not so good. Uh, I just got a, a letter from the Norfolk Aggie School. Uh, district and they are saying that only nine students so far are, are inclined to, to have registered with them to go versus 22 uh, that are, are currently there uh, 
do you have any perspective? Is this normal for this time of year and it goes up as time goes on? Or what is involved? Yeah, so um, th for the Norfolk Aggie applications, uh, they come to my office. And how essentially how that works is um, our uh, vocational high school is Blackstone Valley. Right. So what we have to do is uh, we have to look to make sure that on the application that the family is submitting for that child, that the major or the focus that they're picking is not offered by BVT. If it's offered by BVT, then we don't approve that. They have to go and be accepted at BVT to take it. Um, if it's not offered, and like for instance, animal science is a popular one that a lot of our students will, will apply for. BVT doesn't offer that. So those tend to be the most uh, uh, popular. Um, that's the most popular program that kids want to take. So we approve those. But yeah, we haven't seen a significant number of them in comparison, but. Okay, for the yeah. down, because that's a significant it's a, expense for it is, the town yes. because that's. Large expense. Uh, they were quoting 24,000 per that is correct. student per year. Yep. which is... Uh, and we're about half that. Just ballpark per pupil is yep. about half that. Which is yep. major. Yep. Uh, I don't know what... Uh, oh, it's, yeah. You know, I presume that you're going to be coming over to the town to make a presentation yes. at uh, some time. Uh, when would be a, a good time for you... Uh, folks, I only have one meeting scheduled <laughs> ahead at this point. Sure. But uh, you'd be done with your budgetary process in what? So tonight, hopefully, it, hopefully the committee will certify the budget before them. Um, Tuesday, the 16th at 6 p.m., we will be at the Blackstone uh, Board of Selectmen meeting. And, and then uh, obviously would like the opportunity to meet with the Blackstone uh, Finance Subcommittee as well as, of course, the Millville Board of Selectmen and Millville Finance Subcommittee. Okay. The, uh, so you're certainly welcome to come to the we Finance Committee. and uh, We're trying to catch up with uh, everything, including uh, capital expenditures. Right. Sure. And uh, at that time, not right here, but... Uh, I spoke with you a while ago, and uh, you can give the uh, full committee some idea as to what those capital expenses might be in the future. Or For sure. Yep. What's going mm -hmm. on. I don't think you've got that to the point where you, you're Not yet. really. <laughs> <laughs> we wish we did. It's, it's in the. We're including you in that process. Yes. Yeah. It's in the you just don't know it yet. <laughs> we have next year's capital expenses, yeah, but go. not the long-term long ones. We, yeah, and, uh, and I'm I'm very happy that you started to to fund the OPED business. Okay, uh, I got an updated of what the uh, actuarial study indicated was the unfunded liability. Okay, and Blackstone has done a fairly good job of trying to mass reserves, okay? Uh, but unfortunately, the OPED unfunded liability is several times our reserves, mm -hmm. okay? Which yeah. is a very, very ominous matter that's involved. And I know I have been somewhat of a nag on the subject uh but i think it's important it's important to all your employees okay because we have had around the country a number of pension plans that have simply collapsed okay and as close as rhode island okay where the number of the money that's involved is not you know not adequate and uh, I have tried to put forward the idea that the OPED is really a fringe benefit to all the employees. And to the extent that it is 
uh, needs to be included in the union negotiation, which is the only way you're really going to be able to make a significant contribution on the $36 million liability that I'm told that you're there. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, uh, you know, that, that's the only way of doing it. And I'm a little bit afraid, okay, that when some of your teachers who are here now or have already retired get to be there in 20 years, if we don't do something to do it, the support for OPED will just collapse because the amount of the liability for each year goes up as medical expenses goes up. Mm -hmm. So it's really not the current amount that is, it's the future amount. So yep. I will leave that and I look forward to uh, have you come uh, to that, okay? Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Watson. I, I would say you are 100% correct in the importance of that OPEB. Um, for the community, though, I do w want to emphasize we are, this is not a BMR specific concern. A number of um, most municipalities across the state right now are just in the process of getting into that OPEB trust establishment. And we are, we are definitely taking those steps so that we can try to get ahead of that curve, because you are right. It is it, it, it's super important. I, I believe it's more, uh, the problem is more pronounced in the educational side mm -hmm. of it than the municipal side of the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, Blackstone is relatively fortunate uh, because for many years we didn't have OPED we put it in, I don't know, eight, ten years ago, somewhere like that. So mm. it's only the relatively recent retirees that are covered. That is true. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Mr. Watson. Anyone else? Any committee members? Um, <clears throat> I just want to point out, I made a note here. Um, I know it was one of your slides, but I just want to put more attention on it. Um, that in this presentation, we have over $850,000 worth of grant money, um, which I can tell you sitting here for nine years, there were many years at the beginning when we were asked where our grants were and there were none. So. I, I, this is huge. Um, even though, you know, we have the, we're presenting the budget that we are, there's a lot more in here, um, that has been a work in progress and, and it shows a lot of growth for us. So I, I, I want to point that out to our communities. I agree. That's why we can meet some of our needs right. without taxing our towns. Right. I agree. Anyone else? Committee members, okay. then I will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Moved by Jack. Is there a second? Second. Second by Aaron. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Uh, we'll officially open our regular meeting uh, and start with uh, warrants. I'll entertain a motion to Approve consent agenda A, including warrants and minutes of the February 11th meeting. So moved. moved by Tammy. Is there a second? Second. Second by Carrie. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Any abstentions for people who weren't at the meeting? Okay, great. Um, at this point, I'll open up for public forum. If anyone has anything they'd like to bring in front of the committee uh, to discuss matters of general information or whatever they might have. And hearing none, I will move forward. Um, I guess we don't get questions. Uh, and school committee items. Oh, was Representative Soder gonna, did we wanna 
Is yeah, that I, for yours? Yeah, he's. Uh, I, I wasn't able to make it this evening. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. We'll, we can. We, well, we can talk can. about it. Yeah, event. we can talk about it on the. Yeah. Okay. Um, when are we certifying? What? Or when are we? Oh, in our. Oh, in, okay. Yeah. It's further down. Yep. Uh, actually, I guess it isn't, but we'll do it. Um. Tammy, I'm going to turn it over to you for school admissions policy update. So, uh, in your packet is um, a proposed update for the policy JF school admissions, um, we're adding in um, a few meetings ago, we had some policy updates that required us to include language with respect to students are home, who are homeless and or in foster care. And so this um, particular policy has to be updated to include that population as well. So um, do you want me to read it all? Or? Maybe just that paragraph. Okay. So as you can see in the third paragraph, the Blackstone Millville Regional School, Regional District School Committee recognizes that special circumstances may exist in certain cases and we are adding in language including students who are homeless or in foster care and then what's already there is and reserves the right to modify this policy on an individual basis in the best interest of the student and the school district so we're looking for approval of adding in the phrase including students who are homeless or in foster care to this policy. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion to amend uh, policy JF school admissions to include the sentence including students who are homeless or in foster care in paragraph three. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? I believe this is what now makes us meet the state general law so i don't think it's an issue all those in favor say aye. aye 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 anybody opposed any abstentions thank you um, okay uh and so now we need to approve the warrants that will go to the towns um we have two separate ones one of course is our budget um generally what we do is make all the individual motions and we kind of work our way around the table um, somebody reads them and makes the motion and somebody else can second it. Um, and uh, we'll approve the certification of the FY22 budget. Erin, you want to read the first one? Sure. I move to adopt a gross operating budget for the 2021-2022 school year in the amount of $26,405,152. Okay. It has been moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Gary. Um, it has been moved to adopt the gross operating budget for the 2021-2022 school year in the amount of $26,405,152. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? Tammy. I motion to move to apply the following reimbursements to reduce said gross operating budget for the 2021-2022 year. Chapter 70, $11,035,489. Regional transportation, $537,488. School choice tuition, $277,842. Charter school reimbursement, 109,194. Above reimbursements, total $11,960,013. The total operating budget for 2021-2022 is 27,300,693. It's been moved by Tammy. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by lots of people Aaron uh, it's been uh, moved to apply the following reimbursements to reduce said gross operating budget for the 
2021-2022 year, Chapter 70, $11,035,489. Regional Transportation, $537,488. School Choice Tuition, $277,842. And Charter School Reimbursements, $109,194. Uh, above reimbursements total eleven million nine hundred sixty thousand thirteen dollars and total operating budget for the 2021-2022 year is twenty seven million three hundred thousand six hundred ninety three dollars all those uh, any discussion all those in favor say aye aye, aye. anyone opposed any abstentions sarah Move to assess the amount of $9,865,799 to the Town of Blackstone to be applied to the operating budget for the 2021-2022 year, which includes $7,044,849 for the minimum contribution, $1,255,656 in exclusionary costs, and $1,565,294 in supplemental investments. So moved, is there a second? Second, second by Jack. Uh, there's a motion to assess the amount of $9,865,799 to the town of Blackstone to be applied to the operating budget for the 2021-2022 year, which includes $7,044,000 for the minimum contribution, $1,255,656 in exclusionary costs and $1,565,294 in supplemental investments. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Uh, Tara, you want to go now? I don't have my packet. <laughs> oh, oh, geez, you didn't have one either. I can do the next one. I brought one. the wrong folder. But yeah, okay. someone else. Go ahead, yeah. Carrie. I motion to move to assess the amount of $3,239,741 to the town of Millville to be applied to the operating budget for the 2021-2022 year, which includes $2,270,111 for the minimum contribution, $431,600 in exclusionary costs and $538,030 in supplemental investments. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second by Sarah. Uh, there's a motion on the floor to assess the amount of $3,239,741 to the town of Millville to be applied to the operating budget for the 2021 2022 year, which includes $2,270,111 for the minimum contribution, $431,600 in exclusionary costs, and $538,030 in supplemental investments. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Abstentions. Okay. Jack. To apply the following amounts to the gross operating budget for the year 2021 to 2022 excess and deficiency E and D $140,000, Medicaid $82,000, revenue user fees $89,000, revenue gate fees $15,000, revenue classroom rental $47,000, revenue prepaid <laughs> tuition $100,000 for a total of $473,000. It has been moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Second by Tara. Uh, it's been moved to apply the following amounts to the gross operating budget for the year 2021 2022 excess and deficiency $140,000, Medicaid $82,000, revenue from user fees $89,000, revenue from gate fees $15,000, revenue from classroom rental $47,000, revenue from pre K. Tuition, $100,000 for a total of $473,000. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, Aaron, it's back to you. 
I move to adopt a capital and interest budget in the amount of $360,890 to be assessed solely to the Town of Blackstone, which includes $138,449 for the FWH Middle School, $61,539 for the JFK Boiler Window Project, and $160,902 for the roof projects. Then moved. Is there a second? Second. Second by Carrie. It's been moved to adopt a capital and interest budget in the amount of $360,890 to be assessed solely to the town of Blackstone, which includes $138,449 for the FWH Middle School, $61,539 for the JFK Boiler Windows Project, and $160,902 for the roof projects. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Tammy. <clears throat> Sorry, I make a motion to move to adopt a capital and interest budget in the amount of $128,278 to be assessed solely to the town of Millville which includes $47,588 for the Frederick W. Hartnett Middle School, $2,792 for the Millville Boiler Project, and $77,898 for the roof projects. So moved, is there a second? Second. Second. It's been moved to adopt a capital and inter in Interstate interest budget in the amount of $128,278 to be assessed solely to the town of Millville, which includes $47,588 for the FWH Middle School, $2,792 for the Middle Mill, uh, Millville Boiler Project, and $77,898 for the roof projects. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Tara, you on now? I can. Go ahead. <laughs> I move to certify the alternate presentation of the total budget, representing only monies moving into and out of the general fund. This presentation will be used by the Department of Revenue, DOR, in the calculation of excess and deficiency, E and D. Oh. Is there a second? Second. second. All right, it has so moved. It has been moved to certify the altern alternate presentation of the total budget representing only monies moving into and out of the general fund. This presentation will be used by the Department of Revenue and the in the calculation of excess and deficiency. Any discussion? And that's why you have the second sheet from here from what we looked at mm. before. Can um, do you want Matt to explain it yeah, again? Yeah, I was going to say, have Matt explained it again? Just by why we started with the motion of $26 million. Certainly. I, um, I gave away my packet. But. In short, <laughs> if, you take a, if you take a look at the, um, one is the it in column here? to the left, the column to the left is the district established budget, which if you see along the, the bottom line, You'll see the $25,975,000 number, which we spoke to in the original budget presentation. All that has been done is we, in, in our presentation to the public, we show all of the use of grant funds, all of the use of our collected fees, such as our user fees, our classroom rentals, and our um, circuit breaker money, which is a significant amount of a reimbursement. This, um, the Department of Revenue only wants to see the use of general fund money. So this presentation removes all of the revenue and expenses that would be charged to those other funds. So if you look in the middle between the two main columns, you'll see an offset amount and the offset funding source. So for example, uh, you can see that if you look down at function code 2330, which is our instructional assistance, there's a $100,000 that is removed from that total. 
because we are going to be funding that from the revenue we bring in from our pre-K tuition. And then all of the numbers to the right represent the remaining expenses that will be charged specifically to the general fund. And then that brings the new totals just from the general fund to those listed at the bottom. If you look at the second page in this alternate presentation, you'll see that the revenues as well, if you go to that second page, you'll see just general fund revenues, which only include our chapter 70 receipts, our regional transportation reimbursement, our charter reimbursement, our Medicaid reimbursement, and any use of E&D for the current fiscal year. However, if you note all of the funds that remain are still the same exact amount that needs to be assessed to the town, mm -hmm. which is where the total overall budget does not change at all. It's just removing the grant and the other expenses. And to the right is still the assessments, which are exactly the same as presented in the original total uh, $27 million budget. Essentially, when uh, Dr. DeFalco and I present the original budget to the towns in an effort of transparency, we indicate every single source of funding revenue that we can identify that we anticipate bringing in to show the towns that this is everything that we have to put towards our expenses. And we are only going to look to the towns for that which is left over. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just ask a, so the number on the top of our certification, the 2640-152, that's not on any other paper we have. And nothing seems to like Which add or is? subtract to it. So that's what I'm having. I, I know I should have asked it, it's, but I thought I was being dumb, honestly. It's the school choice sending tuition and the charter tuition. If you add those two numbers to the 26 million, you get 27,300. Okay, thank you. Just those two. Yep. Not all and that is correct. So well, that's because we don't actually correct. send them. We, we don't, money. exactly. So um, I, I apologize if that wasn't clear. No, that's OK. I was, I was processing, but I wanted to make sure, because I, I do remember we made an error a few years ago on this and we number. had to redo it. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure. I, I tried we to were... state it when I showed the $27 million number. Yeah. So we have the budget that we develop as the district. That's that $25,975. Yeah. And then there's the school choice sending tuition and charter school sending tuition, which we are simply assessed. Quite honestly, we actually don't see that money come in Chapter 70. They actually take it out of our Chapter 70 before funds the top, before right. they send it to us. But for the presentation for the Department of Revenue, they want us to show everything that we would have gotten from Chapter 70 and everything that we are going to pay for charter and school choice sending tuition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we still have the last one. Is there any other discussion? All those in hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay. So, um, Tara, you'll need to sign and then that'll get delivered to both communities, okay, they included in their warrants. Uh, and then we have another warrant uh, item, um, which is the school committee stipends. Uh, by Massachusetts general law, we are required uh, as a school committee to, uh, well, according to Mass general law, we're not allowed to have stipends unless authorized by the member towns. So we need to send a warrant article to uh, each of the towns annually in order to have a school committee member stipend. So um, this, the warrant item is on the bottom. The information on why we have to do it is above that, but the warrant item would read to see if the town will vote to authorize the members of the Blackstone Millville Regional 
district school committee to be compensated for their services as such members and to set the annual amount of said compensation at $1,500 per member and $1,800 for the chairman or take any other action in relation thereto. And so annually we would need to approve this as a committee and then send it to each member town and the member towns would need to vote on that um, in the warrant uh, items of their town. So if somebody wants to propose that, make the motion, then I can tell you more. So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it came to our attention that Blackstone has annually had a warrant item and Millville in the past has not. Um, the school committee stipend dollar amount is in our school committee budget. It has been there. Um, and the black and the Millville um, council was under the uh, the assumption that if it's in the budget and the town approves the budget, then the town was essentially approving the stipends. Um, Blackstone submitted the warrant annually, and it always said submitted by the um, superintendent of schools, which it has not been done by them. Um, and so we reached out to our um, council. And their um, indication was that we did need to have the towns authorize by vote annually uh, permission to have a stipend. And that that should say um, that it is for the school district school committee members and the amount of that stipend. So that's what this warrant item says. You'll notice it's, it's, it's different than what was in the Blackstone warrant in the past because Blackstone usually had um, some regulations about uh, if you miss so many meetings or a certain percentage of attendance, and that is not in our policies anywhere. That is not in any of our guidelines or policies and is not part of what the law dictates. So we did not include that um, in the warrant item. Uh, and this is based on the recommendation of our council. Does anybody have any questions? What happens when it if it gets voted down in one town and not the other? Then the stipends are not authorized. Do we need to then recertify a different budget? Mm -hmm. Or no, because it would go down. <clears throat> no. Money would be dispersed. The money would be I don't know, dispersed in other ways, I guess. Yeah. Because the the towns don't don't um, approve line items. They approve a <coughs> total no dollar budget. amount. So, mm -hmm. okay, it would be used right some somewhere else. Somewhere else, mm -hmm. but it, it wouldn't be a big. It wouldn't then. It wouldn't affect anything else. It would just no cease to exist. Yeah, it would not. They would not. The town would not be essentially saving the money unless they don't approve the budget and they lessen the budget approval by. A certain amount but then again that has to be done by both towns and mm. um, but it, again if it's not a, if it's approved by one and not approved by another it's not like half the committee gets stipends and the other half doesn't it needs to be approved by both member towns that would make it interesting around here wouldn't it <laughs> <laughs> gonna make it interesting <laughs> so based on what you're saying I, I remember when it was taken off of from us submitting it mm -hmm. um, it, it actually was when Dr. Davis came in and he was going through a lot of stuff for us and he he presented to, it to us as we did not need to present the warrants because the it is in the line it is in a line item and the budget's being approved on the floor um, but it makes sense what you're saying is the town doesn't approve our line items um, the only recommendation I would have is in good faith to add the line back in saying that committee members must attend or be present at, I think it was maybe 60 or 70%. At the so time. it is, but if we if we choose to do that, we have to amend our policy. We have to have that we in have our policies. Policy. Of, yeah. yeah. But is it a policy that we're compensated? No, our, in, our, in, our, um, in our handbook, in our policy manual, thank you, that's the word, our policy manual, it says we will not be compensated. It, it has the mass general of law, unless approved by the towns which is why we have to go to the towns.
Should we add an, uh, a line in there stating that the money, this is not additional, it's not an additional ask to our budget? I, we could we could add that in our in our description of us sending it. We could do that because it's not a town, so it's not a Blackstone and Millville budget item. Right. We don't have to budget for this. It is in our budget, and it says that in here, doesn't it? Say that somewhere. Yeah. 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 In the paragraph above the one you read, Jane. Yeah. Second to last. But this page won't go to the full town. Yes, it will. Because this will be the description. Uh, at the town meeting. Uh, it should be the description that they include. I have asked that. Okay. You know how they sometimes have the warrant and they have yes. the. Yes, you're right. Why it was submitted. Yeah. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so Tara, this is another one that'll need signature and get to both, whatever, whatever the rules are. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, school committee scholarship. Um, annually, uh, as a school committee, we give a well, two $500 scholarships um, to graduating seniors um, who either are children of school committee or past school committee members or prospective, pr prospective teachers going into the teaching field. Um, and so we need to decide as a group if we want to continue to do that if we want to keep the amount the same and if we want to select the recipients in the past uh, we have not we have allowed the scholarship committee to do that so uh, first question is do we want to continue to give this scholarship it's in the budget right yes yes okay. i'll entertain a motion to give the scholarship Tara? so moved so moved is there a second <laughs> second okay um, any discussion? Who is the scholarship committee? There's a team. I think it's the, the guidance department. department. The guidance. Maybe, yeah. 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 A, a teachers, teachers, administrator. yeah. Yeah. I think that's a I little think that's still group. fine. Unless anyone else. Yeah. Okay. All right. So all those in favor of giving the scholarship say yes uh, or aye. Yeah. Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstain? I will abstain. Aaron will abstain. This year. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. And are we uh, okay with, we don't have to vote on this unless we want to change it, the $500 each, the two scholarships? Yes. Okay. And are we okay with the scholarship committee um, selecting the people? Yes. 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 Anyone else? No? No? Okay. So the yeah. answer to the question is no, right? No for what? Oh, that will pick. Because it's reverse on the sheet, will your committee be choosing this? Oh, yeah. The recipient? answer to that is no. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, school calendar. Aichiwawa. All right. So you should have a copy in your packet. We will, um, if approved, post this on the website. But you have an academic calendar that starts with professional development for staff on August 31st. And the first day of school for students would be September 2nd. Uh, there would be no school the Friday before Labor Day on the 3rd or on Labor Day. And then uh, the last day of school, uh, provided that there are no snow days, or we don't have what we call snow days anymore, who knows? It would be <laughs> June 17th with gradu oh, graduation on a mighty fine day, June 3rd. It's happened before. <laughs> it has happened a lot, yeah. The, there's just um, under June 22, it says graduation class of 2021. I hope I just leave it off to next year. <laughs> <laughs> a little, I'm like, oh, we should have the date. <laughs> it, it says class of oh, 2021. Sure. We'll fix that. 2022. Did eh, we? We'll did let we them do it again. Eliminate a PD day. No, we have four. We have four. We have two, two up front at the beginning of the school year. So it, and it's then, just listed as orientation. Yes, 
Yes, orientation is also PD. And then we have one in uh, November 1st and one in March, March 18th, I think. Right. So we don't get the Martin Luther King a long weekend anymore? Nope. Extra no, we long weekend? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We so moved that in Columbus Day. Is yeah. that, uh, the orientation day is a PD day? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. We used to have the orientation day. Uh, that was the only day before the kids returned. And then we had uh, the Friday of Columbus Day weekend. We had the Friday of Martin Luther King weekend. And then there was a Friday uh, of Memorial Day. Um in mm. may it was, that that's really late for a professional development day so we moved that day to august so we'd have two before the start of the year and then we moved the november uh the october day to november 1st and we moved the january day to march 18th so we would do two in the beginning and then one uh late fall and then one uh spring will those have opportunity to be with the surrounding towns as we have so in so Quite a bit of that has actually ended up breaking up. Oh, okay. They run PD offerings still, so there's still a PD committee. But what they do is they actually offer opportunities throughout the year together. So there'll be some stuff after school. Um, and so they, they run the PD a little bit different than they used and to. And that was more useful for our support staff. I think nurses and, right? or I'm Yep, sure. nurses. I know um, some of our enrichments. Uh, like PE and music and some of those. But again, our, our staff still has the opportunity to participate in those okay. things. Yeah. So the one on September 1st, on the breakdown in, in the middle, it says orientation day, but it's actually a PD day? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. We do that. That's the day we do the convocation and the yeah, it's breakfast. And like welcome, rah, rah. Yep. And then Shish PD. Boomba, but they also have PD. <laughs> With PD. Okay. I feel like we had an additional one. Okay. Do you have a prediction on snow days for next year? Will we be doing remote learning? I don't. I, you know, I, the, the commissioner <laughs> if, um, eliminated what everybody so kindly called the blizzard bag. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then all of this happened. Yeah. And then we started with remote. So he hasn't made a decision on that yet. Yeah. yeah it'll Maybe be once up. we're through this, this next phase. Yeah. That will be the, I mean, I think we have all proven and I don't mean we just BMR, but the state has proven that it is possible to have better than a blizzard bag. Right. <laughs> right. So. Well, sure. and, and while I agree, while I agree with that statement, I would also agree that there will be some people who will always hope for the good old fashioned snow day. I was going to say, I don't know if the rest of you remember. And, <laughs> and, and there, I, I will guarantee there will be people who hope never to see a remote class again mm -hmm. when this is all over <laughs> but in all fairness i think even, we've had that good old-fashioned snow day yep. this year because we knew it was needed jason Correct. knew it was needed yep. and, yep. and then we had the remote day when we knew that it was feasible, it was feasible. Yeah. yep so i think with that in mind that Agreed. it's still something that could certainly be considered yeah i, I agree completely with that okay Does anybody uh want to move to accept this calendar so moved. Second. Okay. And is there any other discussion or any concerns people see other than the class of 2021's graduating twice? <laughs> I will fix it. <laughs> Oops. Mm -hmm. Believe All me right. when I wanted to correct that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I cannot change the countdown. <laughs> nope. No, we cannot. 85 days. <laughs> All right. All those uh, hearing nothing else, all those in favor of accepting the calendar, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. All right, we will make the one grammatical change and get that posted to for folks, because I know they've been asking. Uh, at this point, I'll turn over to Erin, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the superintendent's mid-cycle evaluation results. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do apologize. I don't know if anyone saw the email come with the results. I'm not even sure if it was something you could read. Mm -hmm. I tried four different ways to print it was not happening <laughs> so um i sent the link to it just so you'd have a snapshot and i would um i will continue to work on getting a better copy to everyone um, but in summary um out of all of the um goals that jason is working on um we did have eight members respond um and we've all agreed that he is on target for all of his goals 
Um, except for the student learning goal, it's off top target, um, which I think comes as no surprise to Jason. Yeah. Um, but I'll just share a few of the comments that went with being off target, just because I feel that it's important to note. Um, first one is, I believe Jason is on target for all students to show progress, but I don't know if it's at the, um, if you will meet the 65 to 55% as noted. Um, this Next one is, I think the plans are in place. I think the support is there, but clearly the pandemic is having a critical impact on student learning. Getting them back into the classroom is essential. I am not sure it is possible to reach this goal this year, but there needs to be a clear and concise message to all staff. The expectation is still there. I believe Jason has and is doing that. Um, I think there were a few other... Strong comments. <laughs> this is why we are planning for a recovery year. This is no fault of Jason personally that our student data speaks the truth. Uh, but just as just the fact that we are we have the data and know where we need to implement the resources will be helpful in the recovery for this year of distance learning we could change this goal to the planning ahead goal. Mm. Just, I think that's just an opinion. Uh, based on where the data points are now, it does not appear that this goal will be met by the end of the year, although there is hope as we return more students to the classroom more often. So that was just, that was the um, student achievement goal um, and then the last professional practice goal again we all noted that he is on target for his professional practice goal but um, we did take comments in that section just to see where we all stood um, with Jason's performance and I'll leave these for all of you to read um, separately but there with eight comments on here um, you have eight members that feel you are definitely still taking us in the right direction and support you in your direction. Um, and everyone really thinks you're doing a great job. So I will get you um, a printed copy of this. Um, any questions from any other members? Or anybody want to add concerns? anything? Want to share your comments personally? <laughs> I uh, I know that it has been a year of challenge, mm. and I have said this to every staff meeting I have been invited to recently, and every Zoom call I have been on recently, but I would not change what this district has done, the direction we have gone, and I will stack it up against any, not only in the Commonwealth, but across the across the country. Um, I have a friend who's a superintendent in the state of Illinois, and they are struggling desperately. I, I have watched the Florida system through my mother's eyes, and those children are on the streets playing outside because they're still not in school. So I will, um, and we've, of course, heard Matt and his experiences. So um, I would put what we're doing up against anyone, including private schools in this area, um, and I am really, really, really proud of the work that's been done. So thank you. Thank you. I agree, agree with everything that you said. <laughs> right. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you very summed much. It up nicely, James. I'm sorry? I said you summed it up nicely. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, then we will move to let you see what else what other work you're going to have us do. <laughs> well, thanks for the feedback first of all and i appreciate um all the time effort and energy that went into it and look forward to reviewing it uh deeply over the next few days for sure um so just quickly under my report uh um 
as everyone is aware, I believe Representative uh, Michael Soder is putting together an initiative called uh, the Rise Initiative, where uh, there will be meals served on Sunday. Um, I believe it is March 28th out of the JFK um, AFM Complex Kitchen. And we're really excited to be able to support um, his initiative and his work uh, in our community. Um, this is something that we did last year, or he, that he did last year, and we were able to support that work as well. Uh, and this year, after uh, having spoken directly with uh, Representative Soder, uh, I could hear um, the passion in his voice for this and the importance to him just personally to do this for our, for our two towns. Uh, and so we are 100% behind him and will support him in those efforts from getting student artwork together to uh, deliver with the meals to uh, having our facilities available to having volunteers um, available to help um, pack food and, and um, get food ready for a kind of a grab and go and for those folks who are going to be delivered. Um, so we're really uh, very pleased that uh, he's, he has taken on this huge project. Um, and it's something I know that is, uh, is really important for a lot of people. And, and if people are looking to volunteer or if people are looking for support to get meals and may need that, um, if you haven't heard anything or, or received any information, you can go on to his website. Um, and there is a link to sign up to volunteer and a link to sign up for support. Um, and I hope that both of those are filling quickly because I do know it's important. And, my entire family will be there to help out because we think it's important in this community. So I'm looking forward to it. And uh, just a quick mention, last year, just Dr. Rumka is sitting here, but uh, the JFK AFM Complex did a, a digital a video, I don't know if folks remember, that ran on the cable access. Hmm. And uh, at the same time that the meals were delivered, and, and I remember having some conversations with a few individuals in town that were saying how great it was to actually have a really nice home cooked meal and see our beautiful young little faces from the complex uh, scrolling on their television, um, <laughs> wishing them a nice holiday. So nice. pretty cool uh, to pull that together for our community. Nice. So looking forward to, to helping out again. Um, so moving forward, uh, we are going to discuss our reopening plans and I just need uh, Jesse, to get me queued up here on the screen. And so we're going to take a few minutes this evening. I have uh, a. What, you had another? Yeah, there were two. Yeah. Yeah, no, no problem. Our poor parent in the audience. Is that is this why you are here to? Very patiently waiting. <laughs> now it's not fired up yet. <laughs> Sorry. Um, very patient. Um, so we're going to talk this evening about um, the return of our students to our classrooms and uh, specifically for grades four through 12 and what it will look like to remove the hybrid model uh, in those grades. Um, and what we are looking at is kind of a phased process, if you will. Um, and I'm sure those uh, that are tuning in at home are also aware that the commissioner and the governor uh, have taken a, a strong position on when they expect to see elementary students, middle school students back into our classrooms uh, and are, are uh, still uh, going to be setting a date for our high school students. I will tell you that the dates we're going to review this evening, um, our school system is ahead of those dates. Um, we want the students back in the classroom. Uh, from our hybrid, well, for all of our students, frankly, but we're starting with our hybrid students first, um, as safely and as soon as possible. Um, and so what we are going to be proposing this evening is a model that will do just that, and starting with our youngest learners first. Uh, what I also would like to mention, and we'll talk about it as we are walking through the presentation this evening, is that um, for our students that are in our full remote program, so we have a full remote program, PK through 12. The full remote program will not be eliminated uh, for the rest of this school year. So families that are tuning in at home and are, and I've actually received quite a few emails about this particular issue. If you are concerned yeah. that your child is in a full remote classroom, um, that that is going to be taken away or eliminated, it will not. We will have our full remote uh, programming in place until the end of this school year. 
So certainly don't want our families uh, to, to worry about that. Perfect timing. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so just quickly, um, I want to just remind um, the uh, school community about uh, what we've kind of called our guideposts, if you will, around working through this pandemic. Um, when we were put in this situation uh, about a year ago, uh, the leadership team got together and really put our heads together and said, how are we going to do this? Um, and not just the logistics of remote learning and all the other pieces, but what are actually the priorities in which we will make decisions uh, or, or the lens in which we will look at uh, the issues that come up and, and will help us make the right decisions, the best decisions that we can. And so we identified these three guiding principles uh, that we used as we navigated through uh, really the first few months of the pandemic, but then used them to help us determine uh, for uh, all of you that remember being on those return and recovery groups. We had many different working groups from, frankly, May till uh, about August um, to get our schools reopened. Uh, we used these guiding principles to help us with our decision making as well. Um, so I just wanted to uh, review and remind our school community of those uh, because they have been incredibly helpful. And we will continue to be looking at these as we move forward uh, the next few months. In August, when we had some discussions as uh, a school community about how do we safely reopen our schools, we created two goals. And I want these I do want to uh, review with folks uh, because I think they're critically important. Um, the first is focusing on student physical, intellectual, social, emotional, and behavioral health. Um, that has been the, the main pillar of our decision making and, and really has been the, the largest goal, if you will, throughout the past 12 calendar months in terms of how to work through this. The second is we need to bring as many kids back safely as we can. And we have tried uh, as hard as possible to do that uh, from the very beginning of this process. And so again, this idea of being slow, methodical, intentional is, is really important as we continue to move forward with our plans with these two goals driving us. So a quick reminder of where we are. Um, and this is important because there have been a lot of changes, um, a lot of different uh, unique situations that have come up that have led to changes within our changes. Just when we've got the changes right, there are more changes. Uh, so the flexibility of, of our community, school community, has been, uh, has been great. Um, but we are still, we have a full in-person and full remote models for grades uh, PK through 3. We have our three days by two days, two days by three, uh, three days um, uh, hybrid in place for grades four through 12 and a full remote option for grades four through 12. Um, we did have a site at the Boys and Girls Club uh, running for families on the, um, the remote hybrid days. And I can tell you I am incredibly uh, grateful to both Bruce and Sarah and the Boys and Girls Club board for all of their support. They have been amazing partners. Um, and actually, I uh, have a meeting with Bruce and Sarah next week to talk about how we strengthen our partnership moving forward. Uh, we have a lot of great ideas that we are looking at um, in terms of how to help continue to support one another. So what a wonderful partnership um, that we have had, and we will continue to strengthen that. <clears throat> so a big thank you to the Boys and Girls Club. But that. Uh, uh, that last day will be tomorrow of the during the day uh, school uh, tutoring because we are bringing those children back. Um, most of the students that attended were middle school students um, and those uh, students will be returning um, uh, next Monday, so this Monday. There's a small group that will be returning uh, this uh, Monday the 15th. Um, so we'll be closing that tomorrow. Um, we've had limited transportation as everybody knows. Um, due to um, the initial guidance we had. However, the new guidance is keep the windows down and, you can, and you can load the buses up. So uh, I know Matt has been working with uh, Telstone, our bus company, to talk through what the logistics uh, will be for uh, increasing transportation opportunities for families with that. We have had, of course, our full complement of health and safety protocols. And uh, very recently, or I don't know, it was a couple of months, um, we added a uh, COVID-19 data dashboard that kept up current with all of our cases and 
Um, and um, so, so the community would not only get the updates from me, but also they could check at any time and see where we are with our numbers. Um, we had 82 total COVID-19 cases in our system uh, to date. Uh, that's across 1,900 students and staff from the beginning. Um, I believe that number uh, is a couple of cases higher. Um, I did um, this last week. Um, so I believe that uh, we've gone up a couple of, of uh, cases since then. Um, and of course, we have our rapid testing uh, right here in our school. So this is just a quick snapshot of where things stand currently. So in moving forward with our reopening plans, uh, we've had uh, quite a bit of conversation. Uh, first, we surveyed uh, all of our fourth through 12th grade uh, families. Uh, we did not survey the pre-K uh, pre through three because they don't have a hybrid option. So right now, we're just looking at the hybrid uh, students and getting those <coughs> students back into the classroom. And I'll talk about the full remote students in a few minutes. Uh, but we had 744 respondents. We also sent out a staff survey and we had 133 respondents. So uh, the school committee, I know, received a full copy of all the results and all of the individual comments. Um, and the staff also received the same document so that we could get all of the feedback we received out there. And as you can imagine, uh, to nobody's surprise, the results have been on two totally separate ends, which is the kids have should have been back from the beginning five days, this is too late, to why are we doing this now, it's not safe, to everything in between. Um, and so I just think it's important to highlight that, you know, the feedback we've received from our, our school community throughout all of this has not changed. You know, people have taken the position for one reason or another on whatever end of that continuum they're on, and we've received consistent feedback from families on all ends, which we'll look at some of that feedback in a, in a moment. Uh, but we've also had staff meetings um, in our buildings um, with, our, with the impacted grades. So the four through 12th grade teachers. Uh, myself and um, Jane and Jill had an opportunity to meet with the high school staff and uh, the fourth and fifth grade teachers this week. And um, Matt and Erin had an opportunity to meet with the middle school staff um, on uh, Monday as well. So we felt it was really important to sit down and have a conversation um, with the teachers that you know we are asking them to adapt and change again um and um you know our, our our staff our community have been certainly have been through very uh trying times throughout all of this uh, but we thought sitting down with those conversations with our faculty was critically important in addition to just a survey we wanted to talk um, we've had formal conversations with the uh, teachers and the support staff bargaining unit and those will continue and of course, we are in regular communication with our boards of health. Uh, we spoke to them again just Monday of this week uh, to review these plans. So uh, I won't read all these to, uh, to you, but when we, when we surveyed the families, we asked them essentially, like, what are the most important health and safety provisions to you as a family? So we have a good sense of if there's any place that we could, we could kind of beef things up and improve. Uh, we would get some direct feedback from the community what mattered most. Um, and we asked the same question to our staff, by the way. Um, and physical distancing was one of the most important pieces to our staff. You can see um, to our families, and they could click as many or as few of these as they wanted, um, but it gives you a quick sense of what um, is, is most important uh, as far as the health and safety goes in reopening our buildings. This was probably one of the most important questions from the parent and guardian survey, in addition to the specific feedback. We had a lot of, um, we asked for a lot of direct uh, comments and feedback. Um, but this was really helpful because this gave us a quick snapshot to see where our families are. I will say uh, for those tuning in, um, if the school committee approves the um, proposed reopening plans this evening, you will receive tomorrow a school-specific survey just for you. Um, so if you are, have a child in the fourth grade at the uh, JFK AFM complex, Dr. Remka will send you a specific survey to get your family information um, and will ask you um, if you're in a hybrid, if you want to return in person or if you want to uh, full-time five days or if you want to go full remote for five days. Um, you will have until Friday, March 19th, um, to answer that. So it's a week from tomorrow. 
So Jason, I want to be really, really, really clear, clear to parents. So if parents have four children in the school district, they'll get four surveys. Yes. So if you have one, you'll get one. And you will only get it if you have a student participating in the hybrid model. Yes. Yeah, so let me clarify. So if you yeah. have... Um, if, if you have two students in one school, so if you have a fourth grader and a fifth grader, Dr. Remco will send you one survey, um, but you'll have the opportunity to fill it out like twice for each, one for each student. But if you have a, two students at the complex and one at the middle school, then you'll get your complex survey and you'll get the middle school survey. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And you, and sure you need I'm to fill clear. them all out. You don't need to say, I already got that. I filled it out once. You need to, to we need specific numbers for every single student absolutely this is a student specific thing so the survey that i sent out uh was it was just aggregate like it didn't i didn't need to know family information or grade like we didn't ask a lot of detail we just wanted to get a quick sense where are people uh at in terms of wanting to return their children to the classrooms in um those that are in our hybrid model grades four through 12. so what you can see based on the results if the hybrid model was eliminated what learning model would you choose for your child? About 62% said they would opt for the full five days. So, you know, as much as we have people on, you know, kind of all ends of this issue, this data speaks very clear um, that, you know, over 60% of our families want the kids back into school um, that are in our hybrid model. You can see that we had about 17% uh, percent select the full remote. Um, we had some that weren't sure, and that's fair. We, I, I get that. Um, you know, we will have a Facebook Live on Tuesday. Again, if this is approved this evening on Tuesday, next week at 7 p.m. And we'll have all the principals, the assistant principals, myself, Matt, Jill, we'll all be on. Uh, and we'll do our absolute best to answer as many questions as we can for families. And then we'll ask families by next Friday, so a week from tomorrow, to make their final choices because we need that time to plan. This will cause us to reorganize everything master schedules class lists so you know and we will we will do our best to um, minimize changes for students in terms of teacher assignments um, so please know that uh, but it, you know it all depends on numbers we don't know yet exactly uh, and this was just the hybrid cohort so 17 percent of the hybrid is likely to choose remote remote right. what do we already have in full remote uh, about, well, so it depends on the grade. Yeah. Uh, so a little bit different, but we're around 10 to 15% as a district. Yeah. And, and to be clear, again, this is just going to the people that are hybrids and choosing hybrid will not be a choice for them. So right. hybrid is, is eliminated um, by the commissioner and the whole deal. So hybrid, choosing hybrid, choosing to have your child go two days and work from home at two days is no longer an option. So you're either choosing to have them full-time in person or full-time remote. If you're already full-time remote, you're not choosing. You're not getting this. Right. You're full-time remote. Okay. So the recommendations. So this is what we are looking to do. We are looking for our fourth and fifth graders to return to our classrooms that are in the hybrid model currently. Uh, so we will remove the hybrid option and students uh, whose families choose for them to return, they will return on Monday, March 29th for grades four and five. For the middle school, again, for families who choose to have their children return five full days a week that are currently in a hybrid model, they will return to the classrooms grades six, seven, and eight on Monday, April 5th. The high school, we're doing uh, an additional stages, and I'll explain this in a minute. Uh, we'll be removing the hybrid model for grades 12 and 9 for Monday, April 12th. And then after April vacation, we'll be removing the hybrid model for grades 10 and 11 for Monday, April 26th. The high school is a really complex situation because you have a lot of unique courses um, that are being taught with mixed grades. Um, and you also have uh, students who are hybrid. So you've got in-person hybrid students, remote hybrid students, and full remote students all in the same classroom. Uh, and we have a couple of situations where we have teachers that are teaching that dynamic, but they're teaching from home. 
so we have supervision in the classroom. So all of that needs to be literally undone, and we've got to redo the schedules. Um, so it takes some time, um, and if you, if the other kind of half of that equation is we're starting with seniors and freshmen, because um, our freshman class, frankly, is is struggling significantly with their academics. Um, and that is, to, I don't think, to anybody's surprise. Uh, and we know what the research says about your freshman year and the likelihood of you graduating on time if you don't pass your core courses. Mm -hmm. uh, we have 25% of our freshmen who are not passing their core courses. 25%. We have got to get these kids back in the classroom. Um, and on the other side of the continuum, we kind of talk about our bookends, our seniors. Their last day is May 27th and a lot of them have internships. Um, if I could bring the seniors back tomorrow, I would do that. Uh, we have got to get our seniors back into our building. For the first time, they were together as a class on Wednesday, picking up their senior shirts and doing a class picture with the drone and a, and a grab and go brown bag lunch that they were able to have hanging outside. And you know, when we think about last year's seniors, we all sprung into action. Everybody moved quickly. We tried to do everything we could to make that spring the best spring it you know, could be. But I think we really need to double down our efforts and to see what we can do for this year's seniors because they didn't have any of the beginning of the year activities that they typically do, the bonfire, the class competitions, all of that. That was all missed. They missed last year's prom. Um, there's a lot that, that we, and I know that the high school uh, senior advisors and administration um, have been trying to think creatively and working with the students on coming up with some solutions. But uh, if you're wondering why the seniors are being prioritized, frankly, I wish they were in sooner. So I agree with that. Um, this is a huge, uh, important piece of this. The sophomores and juniors will return after uh, April vacation. And it's not to say that they're any less important. Um, but when again, when we think about the high school, we've got to get the bookends of them back sooner than later. Uh, with that, we have also will be increasing our health and safety provisions. Uh, Mr. Aaronworth has actually purchased um, face shields for every teacher uh, so that they can actually have the eye protection as well as the masks. Um, we see doctors and nurses in those in their face masks and shields all the time um, in, in you know, treating direct uh, patient care and, uh, and, and they're able to do so successfully. Um, so we will have those for all of our staff um, we've increased the part-time custodians that we hired for this year so that they can keep up with the high-touch surfaces, doorknobs, railings, handles, all of those things. Um, and I know Mr. Aaronworth, uh, as recent as this week, was interviewing more custodians. So I know that we are working very hard to make sure that our buildings stay very, very clean. Uh, also things like, you know, bathrooms, things that we may not necessarily be thinking about. We've got to double down in the cleaning to make sure that everything is staying disinfected. 4.30 this afternoon. Oh, another one. Good. Yeah, so that's ongoing, as you can see. Additional air filtration systems for those who, you know, if you have an interior classroom, you probably already have one, frankly. Uh, but for those that feel they either need another one or they need one to begin with, maybe they didn't have one in the beginning of the year, but the increased students, they want one now. Um, we'll be looking at that as well and, and providing, that, um, providing that need for staff. Uh, and plexiglass. We haven't used it really in many cases. We're not going to buy it for the individual student desks, um, but uh, for uh, um, conferencing with students. If stu you know, if a student and teacher needs to sit down and look at some writing together, it'll just provide a, another safety barrier, like you have at the bank or wherever else is. You know, the cashing out at the at the uh, parking shop in town here or somewhere. There's always that kind of barrier. We'll have those for folks who want that as well. Um, as and this is probably the most t discussed uh, issue. Um, and it's certainly, you know, I, I get it, but um, we are currently at six feet as far as separation with our desks. Um, there is a plethora of research uh, arguing for three feet and three feet being uh, just as safe as six feet. I just saw a new study done uh, that the commissioner shared with the, the superintendents across the state yesterday um, that shows that the three feet is safe. We are working very hard to keep all of our desks between four and six. I think we can do this without going less than four feet. We can do uh, at the middle school and in most high school classrooms, not all, 
not all high school classrooms because those are all <laughs> kind of funky shaped, some of them. Um, but we can do, in most cases, 22 desks in a room at four feet apart, all facing the same direction. I don't know that we'll have that many students, frankly, in all the classrooms. If you think about the results we just looked at, if you have a class of 24, right, in a, on, a, on a good year, well, that 24 right now probably looks like 20. And then when those hybrid families make a decision, if you have a couple that decide to go out, that 20 might look like 18. We can do 16 to 18 desks in a, in a regular classroom at the high school at five feet. I say that to say I think we're going to be okay in terms of the distancing with the desks. I don't, I don't see a situation where we're going to need to go to three feet. Um, so we are trying very hard to make the commitment to keep it four to six feet. We're also looking at creative solutions for those classrooms that would require um, you know, more students. So say that classroom of 20 does look like 24 or 25. Um, we've discussed options for like an overflow room where the teacher might stream into the other classroom, like we're doing at the elementary grades and having a partner teacher in there. We have to get the kids back in the buildings. Yep. So um, we are being as creative as humanly possible and as safe to make sure that we can do that. Um, I also um, really appreciate <laughs> CVS opening up their vaccines <laughs> to educators. I know the state did it today, which is great. Uh, yes, Mr. Aaronworth was vaccinated today, which is great. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm bummed. We didn't get a sticker. I didn't get a sticker. <laughs> but we're really grateful for that. Our staff have been working um, around the clock to get appointments. Um, so we're, we're really pleased that people are moving forward with that, too, and taking that extra precaution. Do you know if it's been opened up to the bus drivers yet? I don't know. Oh, that's a good uh, question. So in Rhode Island, the bus drivers can say they work for the school district. That's what I, yeah. yeah. So they, so... So I am telling you, if you're a bus driver, you work for the school district. <laughs> and just check yes. <laughs> the survey simply has that you're employed by a K-12 yeah. or yep, a exactly. different type of district. Yep. So this is school, an independent the bus daycare. drivers are, yep. yeah. bus yeah. drivers are a part of that. Yep. They want everybody safe, mm -hmm. for sure. So those are the recommendations in terms of reopening our classrooms for more in-person <clears throat> learning. If this is approved, once we get through all of this, which won't be frankly till the end of April, we will have um, we will look at the feasibility for having these conversations with our full remote families. And I, you know, we're, we are we're doing our best to meet the needs of everybody, but this is where this is where we are at this uh, March eleventh. Do you have one more? Or do you want to? Next Ready steps, yeah. yeah. Um, we are going to have our principals send these surveys out to our current hybrid families again, um, only in grades four through 12. Um, we are going to continue to rework our classroom configurations. That survey data is so important. Uh, we have to get that back. So we're able to uh, restructure our master schedules and our classroom assignments. Um, we're gonna be reworking transportation. Um, and um, we will have a Facebook Live on Tuesday at 7 p.m. with all of our administrative team to answer any questions that families might have. I assume like we did in the summer, if you don't get some of those surveys, we'll be calling the families individually. Yes, yeah. that's what we had to do uh, in but August. But please return them. Yeah. <laughs> please, please, please. Okay. Questions? Um, I will, before we get to questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve this, and then we can discuss and change and edit and do whatever. So. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve this plan. So moved. Second. And seconded. All right. Uh, and so now, Terry, you got a question? Yes. So, Jason, you mentioned, and obviously this is still, I don't think you have an actual answer, but depending on the numbers, if you have to stream into a second classroom, will there be at least an aide or a power or another adult in that room absolutely. at all grade levels? Yes. If we, okay. if we have a situation that requires that, we will, we will absolutely do that. Okay. The model um, that we've used at the elementary level has been really successful, frankly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are streaming into another classroom okay. and the teacher's kind of floating back and forth mm -hmm. and switching with the partner teacher. Perfect. So if we need that, we'll do that. Okay. And in, in our meeting with the fourth and fifth grade teachers, they really talked about how well that was working and they're already starting to train the fourth and fifth grade teachers so that they get used to that system. Yeah. Nice. 
and it's <clears throat> in the middle school is hiring as well al yep. already already yeah. our tutors from the boys and girls club will be starting here monday okay yeah so the two individuals were, which were moving here to start working okay. here which is great they know the kids, but that's predominantly who's been going. So that relationship's really strong. Do you have a question? I do. Okay. Um, I have a few. Okay. So I I know it's complex. <clears throat> I know you've heard the revamping master schedule. So without getting too complicated about that, is it teacher schedules or is it student schedules that are being changed? Okay, so that is a great question, and the answer is it, is it is feasible that we could have situations where both change. So let me explain what I mean by that. So at the high school, um, we have some situations that will be, frankly, impossible to change, right? If you, if we, because we have so many unique courses, if you are teaching an um, AP chem class, Right, we're running one section of that. And you've got hybrid students currently, and you've got full remote students currently. There's no way to build another section of that. So we're going to have to continue to do some of the, the Zoom in room or whatever, you know, this live streaming. So in some of those situations, we'll have to do that. Um, however, if we think about the middle school, uh, right now they're in a block schedule. So this will actually start when they return April 4th, uh, 5th rather, pardon me. That'll start uh, the beginning of quarter four. They're gonna they're gonna wrap up quarter three a week early, so they can start quarter four um, when they all return to in person. Um, and what they are going to be doing is eliminating the block schedule. So they'll be able to go. They'll be able to shift their schedule back to a regular rotation. The high school, however, cannot do that. They are built on a semester, so they actually have to finish up this semester in a block schedule. But the middle school, by nature of the teaming model that they have and the way their enrichments work, they can actually um, dismantle the block and go back to a regular schedule. I see a question, Tammy. I, I guess my question is why? why? Why can't we continue to live stream so that we're not... I mean, because a, a lot of the feedback we're getting is the frustration of changing the schedules, changing days, change, you know, the, the change part. Mm -hmm. But keeping the live stream, you have the same, you know, some parts are the same because especially at the, you know, when you start changing teachers for elementary folks at this point, that that's freaking parents out to yeah. have a kid readjust. I mean, it's like starting the school year yeah. fresh on, on March 29th, which, you know, so, I mean, for me, as much as we can keep the same and bring the kids back is, that would be my hope. So that's the goal, right? The goal is to minimize about as much. the whole schedule. That sounds crazy. <laughs> the, the goal is to minimize. Uh, so let me say it this way. That nobody would upend a child's schedule because we want to upend that. N nobody would do that, right? We would only do that if there is a significant reason to do so. Mm -hmm. well, I agree with you, Tammy, completely. Um, so we certainly aren't looking to change people's schedules, but I'm not going to sit here and say that it won't happen either. I can't say that. Um, but but you did say, you mentioned AP Chem as an yep. example. So is it, it, is it, I'm feeling like high school will still have some teachers streaming because have, you do have yeah. full remote kids mm -hmm. in that AP class. And sure, they're, not they're gonna have back. to in so some cases. That's not, um, that that's to be expected. For in some school? cases, in some cases. Okay. So do we have enough, I guess it was piggyback to my question is, is there enough room in our full remote classes to add the hybrid kids that want to switch to full remote? But in mm -hmm. considering that, does that mean that they are, they will have a change in the teacher or a class or possibly a class because their schedule won't fit with the teacher, yep. the full remote teachers are teaching. So, so, yeah, so there are, those are a lot of separate questions. I, know. I, I want to try to answer all of them. So, <clears throat> so the high school and middle school are different. The, high, the, the, the middle school does not do the streaming like the high school does it. Right. So, that, so if you are doing live streaming in the middle school, you don't have kids in front of you too. 
the way that the master schedule was built was that if you remember back in the summer, we had we, we gave an example. Say there was five periods, uh, whatever, you teach four, right? Three of those were in person and one was a um, stream. So that's how the middle school set their model up. The high school didn't do that. The high school had basically that room and Zoom kind of concept almost every period. What they are looking to do now is to keep the best they can, the teachers the same for the kids, but they may have to reshuffle the, the, um, the makeup of the periods. So for instance, if you have, because they teach four, right? There's four block schedule, or four classes in their block schedule. They teach three and one is a prep period. So if you are teaching your three classes, and right now all three of them are hybrid and right, like the zooming and the rooming thing, uh, I can't think of a good way to say that. Um, it might look now for the last uh, you know, quarter of the year that you have two of in-person and then you have one that's full remote. Do you see what I'm saying? So what they're trying to do is once they get the numbers back, see if they can reset, mm -hmm. reset those, um, the, the makeup of those classes. And that's why it's super important. I mean, I know Jane just said this, but the survey. We have to get that back. We have, have to, to get them back. That is the only way you or anybody else in this district will be able to answer the questions about changes of yep. teachers and schedules. Yep. And parents have to understand that they have to make that decision before they can get answers. And Correct. that's the only way, right. that's the only order it can go. There's yes. no chicken and egg. Yes. And it's, right. it's that survey yeah. or we don't have the or rest. Or we don't have the, yeah, we don't have to. And, and one person not filling it out can change an entire class. You know, one, you right. know, because that's seats in the room, that's four feet, that five feet, six feet. Exactly. That's a partner, uh, hiring a partner teacher, which it takes time to hire a partner teacher um, and, you know, get that person on board. So, so critical next Friday are those surveys. The other thing, and, and I will say this a million times over, but if we go back to our guideposts, it says everyone in our community has the responsibility to collaborate, engage, and respond to this challenge. Everyone will be challenged. Everyone, the teachers, the staff, the leadership. This is nobody making a decision for anybody else. This is everybody trying with grace and honesty and, and doing the best that they can to meet the needs of the students in this district to provide the best educational experience that we can can provide and we will not make everyone happy we will not we may not make anybody happy but we will do the best that we can and we need parents to respond and families to respond with grace and and calmness respect. and and respect facebook is not the location to say you have a problem you the place to say you have a problem is to make a phone call is to set up a meeting is to engage with people. Um, we need people to engage. We need people to have conversations. Um, we may not get back to you instantly, but we will get back to you. Um, we will do the best that we can. And everybody is and everybody has been throughout this process. And it may not feel like it when you, um, you know, I'm going to speak for myself as a mom. When I get my mom bear act going, um, I know I'm protecting one but we are trying to accommodate 1,701. And we are trying to do that in a way that gets students back in front of teachers in a classroom so they can learn the way that learning was intended to be and we know they learn better. So please use respect and kindness and grace. This is difficult. It is not easy for anybody. It is will be traumatic. For some, we will have the social emotional pieces ready to go. Jill's working really, really hard. Um, our our counselors, our psychologists are all there, you know, ready to help people. But we need family help to respond to surveys and to be kind. One of the things that was incredibly helpful, the high school staff met together and they actually had a printout of every section and we have a copy of this. It's every single section in the, in the building that's running right now. And they're full hybrid numbers. So for instance, if they have 11 kids in you know, group A and 11 in group B, they had that section with 22. And they color coded it. 
So how many of the sections were in white, meaning we can get these kids in one room? This shouldn't be an issue. If they were yellow, it means eh, we're getting a little close. The desks are going to have to get a little push, you know, push a little close together or we can't fit them in one space. Uh, or if, the, if your section was in red, that means you have like 28 or 29 students in that section. So the reason I mention that is because um, they then took their classrooms and actually laid out how many desks at each of the feet, three, four, five feet that they can fit in there. So I just want to give the high school staff a big kudos for putting all that together because I think that that was really helpful. And it gives you a very quick snapshot of what and uh, where the problematic sections are going to be. So my sense is, Tammy, to your piece about not kind of upending schedules, if there are schedules that get changed in some capacity, it, it might end up being those that have you know 30 in a hybrid class because you can do 15 and 15. But it might not because we can stream into another room with a partner teacher, right? So like it all kind of depends on what those parent surveys mention, if that makes sense. I just have one other question. Yeah, sure. So Jason, I support bringing kids back, no doubt. Um, but every time I've heard this on the news since Commissioner Riley has spoken about just axing hybrid, then they always say, um, but your schools can apply for a waiver. So I just want to, I, I want to ask you to clarify that we're not a district that would be in the position and need a waiver to not have a hybrid. And I, I just, I don't know if those questions will come if other people are hearing that on the news, but, um, respectfully, I can't said, think of one district that should be applying for a waiver. The children need to be in school. It has been a year. And so I, I, Unless the committee directs me to apply for a waiver, I will not be applying for any waiver. Well, and and um, the data that we just looked at in in Dr. DeFalco's evaluation indicated our students are not. We that was the only thing we couldn't give him an on target for was the the student learning, right. and they're not learning uh, the way that we have this system, and it's not for lack of trying. Our faculty and our staff have worked harder. Um, than I've ever seen teachers work to try to develop a program that's engaging and insightful and, you know, the learning opportunities are there. It's just, it is just fun to be at home in my pajamas and maybe turn the screen on and maybe not and maybe take that test with a few extra notes next to me and maybe not, which begs me to say, when we say that there is no more hybrid, there is no more opportunity for hybrid, so should a student decide to stay home? If they decide to stay home, they're now absent from school. Yeah. If they go on a family vacation and they come back from that family vacation and they have to quarantine because they went to one of those states that we're not supposed to visit, so short of Hawaii, um, they, will, they will be absent from school, similar to a family that takes a vacation during the academic year and the students required to make up the work that they might miss in the term that we all do not like called asynchronous learning but um you know essentially we are going back to full in-person schooling uh, the remote students will still have their remote options and and they'll stream remotely with their remote teachers but the families that pick in person they are going back to in person and the guidelines around that i mean clearly if an entire class has to um Quarantine, quarantine right and the teachers healthy you know they'll be remote you know there'll be other options and we'll, that will be case by case but a student who has to you know quarantine um from choice of their own or their family or their issues it would be like they would be sick um, and i know you have been sitting here is there anything you wanted to share or concerns that you had so k through three will be the last one to go back k through three is already back did you mean the full remote students? Yes. Yeah, so, so right now we're looking at just removing the hybrid model. The remote model will be in place till the end of the year. Okay, so that's going to save our... Yes. Okay. Yep. Will we have a better idea of what, a, what the bus will look like? I mean, I know the state didn't really give any specific... Sure. Matt, do you want to... Aside from the windows open, but... Um, State your ponchos. Again, that will yeah. It will depend. It will depend on the numbers of kids that are coming back. As best as possible, we'll have as few students per seat as we can. 
Um, the guidance is that there can be two, even three students per seat. Um, the settings on the windows are to be three inches on open on every window. And really what they've done is the research shows that um, the biggest component of concern is the air circulation, the air changes per hour. And when the bus is moving and the windows are open, if students have their masks on, literally the, the air is just constantly moving across, across the bus. And there's very little risk of them contracting any of the viral load. So that's one of the reasons why they moved to these, um, these recommendations. But what will happen is, as someone mentioned, in inclement weather conditions, if it's raining really badly, they can shut every other window. <laughs> and the expectation is that kids and some supplies will get wet. So they are saying that we should be prepared to have our students riding in the buses with their ponchos that they can cover their backpacks with. <laughs> It is the safest, Excellent gold ponchos. Yeah. safest, mm -hmm. safest, and I, safest way. Yeah, and I fully expect parents who are able will be driving. You know, yeah. I, I fully expect that yeah. parents yeah. will take safety. And I and so in our return group that has been meeting, I have asked that we relook at having the um, the officers back. You know, just traffic for that. You know, first week or so back, um, just to kind of make sure that people know what the what the routine is with re people returned mm -hmm. so yeah we'll take care of that chain for yeah, sure definitely. is there a new lunch guidance uh, was that was supposed to come out yeah it? so the guidance that came out around lunch is this they are keeping a hard it's got to be six feet so i i guess our tents will be going back up and we'll be utilizing outdoor spaces and for sure. The so there got requests to purchase some additional tables, uh, not any of the large tables, but like some smaller card tables that kids can sit off in separate areas. It's they're they're a less you know less expensive certainly, and they're just for individual students. So we're potentially looking to utilize any resources that we have and any ones that we can get. I think I'm sure Dr. DeFalco is going to reference we're looking at using other spaces as well. We have individual desks set up in parts of gym, the gymnasiums that are spaced out. Uh, there's also districts have been entertaining as we would if necessary. Um, parts of classrooms will go down to a cafeteria or a larger space while other parts of the class stay within the classroom setting so that they can be a minimum of six feet apart. Um, so there's a lot of options and the principals and, and myself are going to be working on those specific schedules in the upcoming days. With respect to that, I mean, could we ask, I mean, I, you know, I have a lot of folding plastic tables that I'd be willing to donate for a couple of months with my name on it to get back up. I mean, rather than purchasing these things that hopefully we'll never need again. <laughs> <laughs> I say that with all the positivity I can muster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I'm just thinking, I mean, you know, if we put out and possibly borrow folding tables or something like that, I, just Cer an idea. Certainly, idea. certainly an option. It's an excellent idea. I probably have about and five, now we know so. who, now we know who to call. <laughs> Everybody bring their pop-up tent. Have everyone, every, each student bring their own table. Yeah. Well, bring, some bring of, own. some <laughs> of those, some of those pieces where it really, we appreciate the support and we want everyone to be able to contribute. There's also certain liability aspects. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, sure. Particularly with pop-up tents, if we're taking them from people. He does not want your pop-up um, tent. But, I don't own one, so it's okay. But not to say that we will not explore that and really see what we can we can do about that, because it is appreciated. Any other? One more. Sure, absolutely, More please. Clarifier. Yep. So, I am a third grader. So, is it is the plan that we won't be? So, we didn't move to Blackstone until November. So, the full in person was full, so he wasn't able to have that option. So, he's full remote. Is it oh, yeah. safe to say that he'll stay full remote? Do you, do you so the do you want your principal sitting right there? Do you want to have a? It, it, do you want to speak with Dr. Remka? I don't know if you want to have an offline conversation and see what the issues are and see what the options are with that. Okay. Yeah, okay. Just, I, you know, I'm trying to figure out like, what, why. 
Totally get it. Yep. No. Yep. You came in the right night. That's like yeah. the perfect yeah, person to talk that's to. Why you know. <laughs> that's why you approach the, the things that way. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, the weight. <laughs> and again, you know, we're not trying to exclude groups of people. No. We just are trying to make this work. And the, the best way to make it work, the first go round, is to bring the hybrid folks back. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, right. And if we can have a second go round, but if we can have a, a middle go round, that works too. Mm -hmm. I do have a comment. Also. Yeah. We things work here as far as him doing the schooling is so much better. Um, he's just getting so much more out of it, and I am extremely pleased. Um, I have to say, the teachers, they all need a raise. <laughs> <laughs> we agree. I struggle on a daily basis with one at home. I can imagine doing it from, from home with 15, 16 of them, however many they have. It's, they all deserve a raise. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Okay, there's a motion on the floor to approve the uh, return to school plan of uh, grades four and five on March 29th, grades six through eight on Monday, April 5th, grades 12 and nine on Monday, April 12th, and grades 10 and 11 on Monday, April 26th. All those, all those in favor of that plan, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. You have your work cut out for you, sir. We sure do. Thank you for the support of that. This is very important. Um, we will get to work. Um, in your packet, you received um, a when your packet was delivered, you received a one-pager that had a two-year athletics cycle, a uniform cycle. Uh, we, uh, I misunderstood Matt's direction. I, I replaced one for the other. I was supposed to put one on top of the other. <laughs> so um, I brought the back up this evening. So uh, you should have the actual cost breakdown for all of the uniforms Thank you. for uh, each of the um, sports, boys, girls, varsity, JV, middle school, I think it's all broken down in the actual cost there. So essentially uh, what we have before the committee this evening, um, and the money is in the revolving account, the issue is do we wanna do a four year replacement cycle or a six year? And Matt, I know you can speak to this better than I can. Oh, sure. Um, so what was, what was added are just the specific details of all of the components of the uniforms and for each of the teams. So uh, if you look, there's a four-year cycle that outlines um, the very specifics of first year replacing the boys soccer varsity in middle school girls soccer varsity in middle school boys track and field then you have the next year the field hockey varsity field hockey jv girls basketball varsity and basketball jv and then the middle school basketball boys and girls that would be in year two with all of the totals. Matt, without that, going through every one yeah, of them. I was going to say. Essentially, <laughs> essentially you have two two exactly different packets and, and one is a has four years worth yep. of change and one has six. The, the one pager that was included right. um, is actually a summary with none of the specific numbers. Right. But it's a summary of the four year cycle and the six the six year cycle that's proposed. The, there's a little key up in the corner where the, which are the fall, winter, and spring sports. Mm -hmm. The major difference are the the major difference is each year for the four year cycle is between approximately eight and nine thousand dollars per year, and each year for the six year cycle is between about six and seven thousand dollars per year. Um, there's also some considerations um, of the incentives that we get from the from the, the uh, sales places that you know they give like a fifteen hundred dollar rebate depending on how much volume you have, so that kind of helps lean towards the four year cycle in, in in one sense of the word. So, so personally, I would lean towards the four year cycle because I can't imagine wearing a uniform that's in year six. Like I just to me that's I don't know. Kind of a long time, personally. 
Um, I agree with that. Like 10 years old. And just seeing the difference between <laughs> the four year and the six. It's so the old. first year of the fourth of the four year, we'd be doing track track and field. But if we did the six year, it would be like the fourth year that we'd be track yeah. <laughs> So I just feel like that's a huge time difference. I do have one question, though, just for clarification, Matt. At the bottom where it says reason for replacing boys varsity, boys middle school, girls varsity, girls middle school is the possibility of needing swing players. Mm -hmm. So are we are we purchasing like one through 20 in the same uniform so these players can play up? and yep. back yeah, because yeah. i think the boys baseball just completed their jv uniform our boosters purchased baseball uniforms last year and they purchased the matching uniform to the varsity <coughs> right yeah Correct. that's that, that is the be... intention of the swing getting them in the same cycle is so that there's the kids that may go from jv to varsity for every have, sport for everyone will have the same uniform mm -hmm. so they they can move up or down as as needed without being the one or two kids on the field with a different with a uniform. different jersey anybody have any questions or comments about that or for matt or does anybody have a decide. motion it's... preference oh that, that sorry that's not how it is for the boys basketball for some reason boys middle school basketball is on the second year and the varsity and jv are in the fourth year Maybe there's, a, there's a lot of asterisks on these <laughs> pages. I'm trying to follow the. Yeah, there's some specific details. These these cycles were put together by the athletic director, Robert McNulty, and I was going to review them, but there are some specifics that I think could be noted. That's the general gist of what the, you know, the purpose of getting them together, though, is, is the swing. So this the swing says youth sizes for middle school. Maybe that's why. Uh, no, because the middle, but middle, middle school, school doesn't doesn't swing out school, in that JV sport. And varsity, right, JV and varsity, right. Where the other ones don't player. have that. Yeah. Middle school doesn't swing up to JV. Yeah. They usually just three, right? if they yeah. play, they're on JV if they're eighth grade. Correct. Mm -hmm. Just there. Yeah. Oh, well, that's not how it was in my kids' year, but that's okay if that's what we're doing. Is year one really this year, or is that just a typo? No, it's this year, right? So all this would happen order anything out of this year. budget? Should okay. be this should be this year. And be. Matt, do you know the the bottom note? Like usually the asterisks are near whatever it's referring to, but we just have this <laughs> random shorts weren't ordered. I don't know what that goes what, to. Yeah, those are goes with. Yeah, the um track. I think that was for the the um There's no price on the shorts for track. Yeah. I believe I believe that's the case. Um, but I feel like we do have shorts now, right, Tammy? <laughs> yeah, it was the tanks. So it, it says the boys and girls tracks were placed uh, last fiscal year. Um, the track uniform actually, the costs, it was just the tanks. It was just I, the. I guess our basic question is four or six, right? Yeah. Four or six. The, our the question is four or it. six. Yeah. I would lean towards six. Just because, like I said, my, I, I had volleyball uniforms that were over a decade old. Oh. Oh. <laughs> they were sweet. Oh. The fact that you still I wish I still them had them. tells me that I don't want to traumatize our kids in our district in <laughs> no. any way. <laughs> we'll never find one of those photos. I know we have. So you know I'm on a hunt now, Sarah. Right? <laughs> it was pre-internet. Never happened. Okay, I can go back to the school. There are pictures in the hallway. <laughs> I will find it. To me, the four year just makes more sense. Every if a, if a kid is participating, middle school through high school, they will always cycle out of. And, and if we did a six year, there could be there could be kids that never have a new uniform. A new uniform. Not that you have to have a new uniform, but like you just said, to it, wear that six year old uniform, it, it's representing our schools too. You know, and it, it, it does affect the team spirit and the team, it, it, it it's. And the rebate is higher. I would Go imagine that the more four. you're purchasing, the yeah. better the incentives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. The 
Anybody want to make a motion? I will make a motion that we support a four year um, uniform, proposed new uniform cycle, the four year option. Is there a second to that? Second. Is there any more discussion on that? Other than Sarah wants uniforms that can stand up on their own. That's right. <laughs> Polyester. Or pull yes. apart because it's old. <laughs> I just, I'll point out that beyond the uniforms that we supply, I can personally say um, that parents and students, that, that we are always buying the spirit jerseys and, you know, the, the named shirts to match. Um, there is always an expense to the families um, beyond what we supply. So, and, and I've seen teams come together and do some amazing fundraisers. I know the cheerleaders have done it to get all of their own jackets. Um, football boosters is always purchasing items needed for the football team. So I, I think this is the least we can do for the, the programs. Supporting the effort. Anybody who knows my kids, they're like, yeah, she would vote against it. My kids walk around with holes in their clothes, so <laughs> I shouldn't even, I should abstain. <laughs> oh, God. We love you, Sarah. We might have some um, uniforms that we're going to write off if you need yeah, any. Surplus, 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 surplus clothing. Send them this way. Send them to Sarah. All right, we digress, and it's late. All right. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion for a four year cycle say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any, uh, anybody say no? Nope. Whatever it is, nay. Anybody, I, no. any abstentions? I voted yes. You voted yes. Okay. You're, you're the right. loudest eye here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Matt, four <laughs> years. Excellent, thank awesome. you. Okay. Um, uh, next, just in your packets, it may, um, the high school is working uh, very uh, hard with their work on equity. And uh, they're starting to uh, develop their partnership with the Anti-Defamation League. And um, the students and staff will be signing uh, um, a No Place for Hate pledge. And um, in my last conversation with their student group, uh, we had discussed um, with a couple of the students that uh, I was going to bring this before the committee and talk to the committee about signing off on the pledge as well and um, to bring the pledge to the students with all of your signatures and we can laminate it and really put it together nice for them. I know it means so much to the students to have so much support from the school committee on this. So um, you may have all ended up with individual. We did, but I'm off. sending send a master one, master one around. I mean, That's certainly perfect. we need to approve it and agree, but um, I think that tremendous effort has been made. We know that that was one of the guiding um, issues for the district. Um, and I, I know that as a school committee, we've made a commitment to try to learn ourselves and grow ourselves, um, in this area. And so, uh, I even talked to Dr. DeFalco about maybe even putting some banners up in the school with this pledge and maybe even the signatures of all the people who had signed or something just to, to make names stand out and just to, to do more than just watch. Um, to actually take action. So I commend the students who have done this. Yes. Um, it's a tremendous effort and any way that, that we can support them, I think is really important to do so. So um, I will gladly entertain a motion to accept the pledge. So moved. Second. Okay. And oh, any other discussion? Really too bad we didn't buy that banner maker, Jane. I right, right. <laughs> I still, I still dream about that, Tammy. I still want color printer, color banner maker, Matt. Okay. It's a little bit hefty up there, but you should go uh, back to that six year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no? Back. Oh yeah. Oh, Karen. Let's forge it. Okay. Oh, so it says. We would never do that. Um, I will seek to gain understanding of those who are different than myself. I will speak out against prejudice and discrimination. I will reach out to support those who are targets of hate. I will promote respect for people and help foster a prejudice-free school. I believe that one person can make a difference. No person can be an innocent bystander when it comes to opposing hate. I recognize that respecting individual dignity and promoting intergroup harmony are the responsibility of all students, and I would ask, add all staff and all community members. 
So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Great, thank you. And then uh, lastly, just a quick last item on my uh, report. The uh, town of Blackstone was, the Board of Health was issued their uh, vaccines to run two more clinics here. Uh, so in your packet, there is a, a facilities use uh, both Saturdays. I think one is the 20th and then one is, is it the 20th and the following Saturday? The 13th. The 13th, 20th. it looks like. Oh, the 13th. Okay, This so this Saturday and then the following Saturday, there was two. Uh, we just had uh, received that information from um, the town of Blackstone um, because, frankly, I think they had just received the information from the state. Because so, originally they gave the round one, then they round two was taken away, now yes. they have round two back. Yep. Okay. All, right. all those in favor of... Oh, there you go, Tammy. No. All those in favor of approving the use, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Even though we had no motion, but that's okay. Somebody move it. So moved. Okay, thank you. Second. Okay. Who's my report? That uh, Mr. Aaronworth. Uh, <laughs> sure. So uh, the first piece on my report is the excess and deficiency overview. This is simply an update. Our EMD was certified by the Department of Revenue. Um, for clarification, uh, the EMD was certified at four hundred and eleven thousand two hundred and fifty-seven dollars. Um, that I know is not the highest that the district has seen it, but I do want to point out that that takes into consideration <clears throat> that we allocated $167,000 for resources, curriculum resources for FY21. In addition, we also anticipated the loss of state revenue for FY21 and allocated $300,000 of END to offset that loss of revenues. So that is $467,000 that was taken out of what END could have been certified at and applied to the FY21 revenue. However, our state revenue came in as originally expected, so we will not be using that $300,000 right off the bat. And additionally, we, um, we were able to purchase in advance some of those curriculum materials. So while it is certified at four hundred and eleven thousand uh, dollars. There will be money coming down back down to E and D at the end of this FY twenty one fiscal year. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Next piece in my report are the revenue and expenditure reports. So if you look at the total revenue, the total revenue <laughs> report. Sounded like uh, doing that. Yeah, it's getting late. Um, uh, yeah. Hour, what, 15? <laughs> so um, in both the revenue and the grant expenditure uh, report, everything is coming in as expected on the revenue end. There's a highlight on this page that you'll see under the function code uh, 38 is the state coronavirus prevention mm -hmm. money. Uh, apparently, when they released the COVID money, there was uh, a little over 15, I believe, 15 million dollars that was given directly to the Department of Ed to do with what they chose. And um, they held on to that for some time and then developed just a formula and then just distributed that to districts. So this is a new source of revenue that we have. Uh, it just came out. Around, it just got distributed in February. So it wasn't expected. You can see in both, um, you'll see in a moment when you look at the expenditure review, really we're just going to be using that to offset Partner the other corona and... expenses. Yeah. Yep. So the total of that was about $80,000 and um, you'll see that in the expenditure review. Yeah. Questions about the revenue report? Can I just make a comment? <clears throat> Am I the only one that gets nervous when they see this and everything's in red? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've wanted to say this no, Tammy on, said the on same Zoom, thing. <laughs> and I just refrain, but in person, I'm going to say it. Every time I see this, and the parentheses, I'm like, oh, wait, nope, it's a revenue. 
<laughs> Hammy said the same. Thing. Okay, <laughs> just making sure. Revenue, yeah, the credits the are considered. The credits are considered negative to yeah. the account, which is the re, which is the revenue. Right. But it's. I will. I will look at revising the report <laughs> okay. so that it just sparkles. Just with wanted black. to know if I was the only one. <laughs> Make it black. You and Tammy. Uh, it is. There is nothing alarming <laughs> about these numbers. They are all, it's all, all in alignment with what On we would expect. On the next page, though, no. no. On the next page, <laughs> on the next page, um, the general you can see the general fund expenditure review on the first page, which where those uh, negative, the negative numbers actually are black. That means we are going to under expend in, to that amount. Um, but as you have been already aware of. The second page on the expenditure review introduces the grant funding and then totals out at the bottom the, the general fund uh, expenditures and the expenses that we are anticipating from the COVID uh, funds. So you can see that still we're anticipating, even with the coronavirus prevent, prevention funds, we're anticipating um, overspending our corona uh, expenses by about 300 some odd thousand dollars we also have one hundred ninety-four thousand dollars that we have just emergency COVID expenditures we're hoping for reimbursement from uh, mema on these but it's it's not a guarantee so at this point all total expenditures are looking as if we are still comfortably in the black right now at about a three hundred and eleven thousand uh, dollar place marker so, and this is conservative i try to make sure that we won't end up in a place at the end of the year where there's anything startling other questions about the expenditure review and as always, if anyone has specific thoughts or questions at another point, you can you can email me individually. I do have a, a question. Yeah. So based on um, returning to school, the hybrid um, hiring some additional staff and stuff, do we still think this number is that accounted for anywhere? Or so this number go down with having to hire. It'll go down. It'll yeah. go down. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That being said, we're also still hoping for an additional round of stimulus money that may it was, get it was signed today. Signed today, yeah. It may get introduced as early as for use in this year, but um, we're not entirely sure. Okay. There is also the personnel update, just for record, and. Um, we do have a surplus disposal request in my report this evening. As you can see, uh, we received a request to dispose of three deli coolers, one milk cooler, one ice cream cooler, and one utensil card. And you'll be happy to know that the snowblower referenced is the one that's held together by string. <laughs> and it will... Yeah. Did we get a new one for them? We did. Oh, thank uh, God. Yeah. There was a new snowblower purchased. Thank God. <laughs> so uh, that just requires the action. Yep, this that. does. So I will entertain a motion to bring the ice cream cooler to somewhere where we can all have ice cream. Sorry, my house. They don't, they don't work. You're not going to want ice cream. They don't work. work. <laughs> They're no good. <laughs> Second. Okay. Um, been moved and second to request disposal of uh, items from the middle school and a snowblower from MES. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. The ayes have it. And lastly, I have uh, a facilities report. Very minor things. Um, again, these the heating units at all of the buildings, particularly the high school and the complex, the coils are starting to go on them. So we did once again have a, a leak and a coil replacement. Um, the wheelchair lift at, at the complex is being repaired. It's not a significant cost. Um, at Millville Elementary, you can see there were some exterior doors that had some hinge problems last time. Those have been fixed. There was a magnetic locking issue, which has also at this point been addressed. And the building passed its inspection 
last week. So, yeah. Um, the, a big piece is the middle school driveway that I know has been a concern for many people. Mm -hmm. uh, we did do um, a quick temporary patch on a couple of the spots. We have uh, Brienne paving coming also to look at patching some of the remaining areas and then we will get an estimate on what it will take to really uh, resurface that. But again, as we're gearing up for our capital planning subcommittee, this is one of those probably uh, priority items that we will that we will bring to the table and address as a group. And that concludes the facilities report if there are no questions. Questions for Mr. Aaronworth? Okay, hearing none. Any school committee members that have reports or questions or items for of interest? Janet. Jason, do we have a, or does anybody actually, uh, Terry, don't you? Um, the date, is there an empty bowl thing this year? Or is, I, I thought uh -huh. I saw something come by from I know they're maybe, trying to, maybe they changed it, but they are. And I think they're, I believe I had a conversation. Um, and I, I believe that they're trying to do like a grab and go so they can still do the fundraiser, but you'd pick up the soup in the bowl, but you wouldn't have it uh, together. Okay. Yeah. I thought I saw it, but then, um, I don't have um, anybody to follow up on. I, you know what? I can, I, I can find the date out for, for you. Yeah. Just something I know that um, is a good fundraiser for them, and I didn't know if they had found it with it. I, I thought I saw something. Mm -hmm. Did anyone else see it? I did not. I did not. They did come up with a, con a way to do it. I just for, I cannot remember uh, the date. But I saw it. I don't remember where. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for March 25th. It will be here. We'll start having our meetings live and in person again. Uh, so that's a good thing. And then I will entertain a motion to move into executive session, to end this meeting, move to executive session and to adjourn from executive session, not to return. So moved. Moved by Tara, is there a second? Second. Second by lots of people. Erin. <laughs> yes. yes. Tammy. Yes. Tara. Sammy, did you say yes? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Sarah? Yep. Carrie? Yep. Jack? I'm good. All right. Thank you. And uh, are we going to, we're going to move? Yeah. I just need.